Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Today is July 27th, 2023. And we're ready to present another great program by Dr. Sarah Zalek, A Good Night's Sleep, The Mediator's Superpower. As you know, there's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank if they like what they see. And every week, one of my favorite parts of the program is when we announce the running total of just how much our generous audiences have contributed. Natalie, would you like to share the good news this morning, please? Jeff, I would love to share the good news. So for each dollar donation, depending on the power buying uh, capacity of your local food bank, each dollar can equate to between eight and 10 meals. That's enormous. That means that our audience, Jeff, has donated millions and millions and millions of meals for Will Work for Food. Today's grand total is $426,277.42. Thank you all so much for your generosity. Wow, that is fabulous. Thank you so much to our wonderful speakers for motivating these contributions and to our generous audiences for stand, stepping up in such a magnificent way. And today we're going to have another Great presentation that's sure to keep you awake and on the edge of your seats on the subject of sleep. A good night's sleep, the mediator's superpower. Sleep is essential to mind and body well-being. It's our secret weapon in optimizing our physical, mental, and emotional health. We want to demystify the science of sleep, why we need it, and what happens when we don't get it. We're going to talk about the essentials of sleep disorders, how to recognize them, what to do if you might have one. Also, strategizing ways to survive and thrive when sleep is hard to come by. There's nobody better qualified to discuss this with us than Dr. Sarah Zalek, MD. She's a sleep neurologist who has been practicing sleep medicine with a mindfulness approach and teaching about sleep with relevance and humor to a wide range of audiences for more than two decades. She is a clinical professor of neurology at the University of Illinois College of Medicine, medical director of OSF Healthcare Sleep, and has published numerous papers and book chapters. She has developed and led conferences that integrate mindfulness, art, and science to foster individual wellness and reduce burnout. In addition, she has led the development of a compassion-based communication course that connects individuals to work together toward shared goals. She's a frequent keynote speaker, advisor, presenter for media organizations, including national public radio, government agencies, professional societies, educational institutions, and a broad range of businesses. I also hope that today we'll be able to discuss mediators' strategic use of sleep and fatigue. We all know that mediators have conventional wisdom wear them down and they'll settle. At what point is that a legitimate tactic? And when does it become unethical or even abusive to get people to stay with the process when perhaps they're too fatigued to make decisions rationally? We're looking forward to a great presentation. Dr. Zalek, please tell us a little bit about the food bank to which you would like people to contribute if they're in a position to do so. And then please keep us awake with the talk about sleep. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's such an honor to be invited to this organization and learn what you do and what you're doing to educate yourselves through, through presentations, but really how you leverage this, this format to feed people. And the food insecurity problem is global and significant and no less so in the United States. And I'll tell you about Peoria Grown. It's a local food uh, food uh, insecurity mitigation program that's not just a food bank, they, Peoria, Illinois has um, one of the poorest, five poorest zip codes in the United States. Uh, 60605 is on the south end of our town, and it has been uh, socially decimated. A lot of the population has moved out. It's a terrible food desert. So Peoria Grown has uh, gone into that, that area and provides produce at very, very low cost 
and shows people not just that doesn't just provide produce at low cost, but actually teaches people how to acquire produce and healthy food choices and how to prepare them and how to change their dietary lifestyle. So it's not just a food bank, it's a it's a food supply and educational program that's changing the way people in our poorest area um, are eating, feeding themselves and eating. And so I love the, and, and when I told them that I was going to be doing this and about your organization and and the support that they might receive, uh, a little support from, from the, the listeners to this talk, they were over the moon, really thrilled to have been included. So, and we have, we have several food banks and food source programs in Peoria, but they're just wonderful. They're doing good work to change the way people make choices about feeding themselves and give them access. So thank you for allowing me to, to uh, put them up for today. There we go. So Jeff suggested this, this topic, a good night's sleep, the mediator's superpower, knowing that uh, you all might have a need for sleep health knowledge yourselves, but also understand the sleep health or sleep sleep uh, strategies for the people that you're working with. And I'm, I'm going to talk to you about sleep. I'm going to give you a broad swath of knowledge of, of information about sleep and kind of the mechanics of sleep, and then some strategies for yourselves to use if you have trouble sleeping or want to mitigate sleep deprivation so that you have a package of information for yourselves, but you also understand the science of how sleep works for, for yourselves and other people. Knowing that we're a little bit similar. I'm a doctor, you guys are, are mediators, and you guys have a very, many of you are in, in um, very high test situations. You, it, it sounds like you, some people work long hours, you have cases or, or situations that go, um, that, that extend into the hours of the night that might lead to sleep deprivation. And so, uh, not unlike me as a doctor, you sort of are on call and sleep deprivation is the part of the deal at some of the time. And I'm sure many of you travel and have jet lag. So I'm going to give you um, some information. Not all of it will be relevant to everyone, but it will be, there'll be nuggets in there for all of you. And then I'm going to try to leave some time at the end to have a, a little discussion. So I'll try to mind the clock. We're going to move swiftly so that I can get to some strategies for you at the end before we have uh, time to have a conversation. And I love that some of you are on camera. I, for those of you who've done plenty of speaking, it's, it's much more fun to see who you're speaking to. So thank you very much for joining on camera. Okay, this is a cathedral. Um, this is the, uh, the cathedral in Reims, France, and it's a Gothic cathedral and it has these beautiful arches and they're delicate and yet very strong. And so they're the foundation of this beautiful piece of architecture. And look at the Gothic windows in this cathedral and the archways inside the Gothic arches. The, and the, the, the architecture that built this 11th or 12th century cathedral is so strong and yet so delicate, but it works to, to survive the many, many centuries that this cathedral has needed to, to um, stand. If you think of our, our own structure as kind of our own cathedral in a way, all the fa factors that go into our well being are the, the elements that build our arch, our delicate arch. And look at the things that, that contribute to all of what we are growth, learning, strength, memory, weight, balance, emotion, performance, and resilience, all of those pieces of the two pillars of this arch um, are led to the top keystone, which is sleep. Sleep is the, the keystone to the complex and delicate arch comprised of all of our physical, emotional, and co cognitive build building blocks. And so I want you to think of sleep as not extra or not something that you'll do when you're dead if you're <laughs> not something that is to be left to the end of the, the priority list, but really something that is foundational and the keystone for all the things that build us into whole humans. And this seems obvious, but I'm gonna tell you that sleep is a reversible behavioral state of perpetual disengagement from and unresponsiveness to the environment, which means we go to sleep, but we're not dead, we're not comatose, we're responsive to stimuli, but much less responsive, of course, when we're sleeping. And it's reversible. It happens and then it unhappens. And sleep's an active process. It's not passive. A lot happens during sleep. So it's not just turning ourselves off. There's growth and biological repair and memory consolidation and emotional processing. And the third piece of this is that sleep is fuel, just like the sandwich on the plate in this picture. Sleep is fuel. It is not optional. You can't just choose to forego sleep. You'll die. 
And so there are many consequences to sleep deprivation we'll talk about, but that's kind of the crux of what we're talking about uh, to start with. That is sleep. Normal sleep, it might not surprise you to know that normal sleep is between seven and nine hours of not a night, but it might not be what everybody's getting. So uh, normal sleep is about the same time each night. Your brain has an internal clock, the circadian rhythm that says, sleep about the same time each night and be awake about the same time each day. And not being sleepy in the daytime is normal. And just give me a thumbs up or something on the screen if you can give me a reaction to tell me if you sometimes or fairly often feel sleepy during the day. Okay, I see that. So, and so yeah, I, I put this picture up of the statue to say, talk to the hand, because many people will say, yeah, seven hours or seven or eight hours a night, same time each night, no daytime sleepiness, oh, sure thing, not gonna happen. It is more achievable than many of us think. So this is um, a, a graph of an overnight sleep test. We call this the sleep architecture graph or a hypnogram in which you can see, can you see my mouse? All right, so at the beginning there's wakefulness and then we drift into light sleep and deeper sleep stages and one, two, and three. And then dream sleep or REM sleep happens about 90 minutes in and then recurs about every 90 minutes. And you'll notice that deep sleep is prioritized in the beginning of the night and REM sleep gets more abundant during the second half of the night. That's just a little roadmap of how we, we all normally sleep. Six is the magic number. So I say that um, uh, we need seven to nine hour, hours of sleep. That's how we're programmed. Many people get less than that. And some people feel fine if they've only slept five hours. But I'll tell you that even if you're a superhero and feel like, oh, I'm fine at five hours, most of the time for most people, except a few genetic outliers, six is the magic number, meaning we need six hours of sleep or more on a regular basis to perform optimally. And if you get fewer than six hours of sleep on a regular basis at all, you're gonna have lapses in performance, even if you don't know it. So it might be cognitive performance, physical performance, emotional performance. You might be crabby and not recognize it. Other people are gonna notice. And you might make mistakes that you're not necessarily gonna be aware of if you're sleeping fewer than six hours. So regardless of how you feel, sleeping six hours a night leads to performance, less than six hours a night, fewer than six hours, leads to performance impairment. So six is the magic number. Here's a little graph that I've taken from Johns Hopkins. It's just a consumer info, infograph that gives some highlights of sleep deprivation effects. And so I want you to know that long-term, there's a 33% increase in dementia risk, for example. Uh, it takes three to five years off your brain age if you're sleep deprived over time. That we're three times more likely to catch cold, right? So sleep or you'll catch your death, but yes, we're, it actually lowers immune system function. We're 48% more likely to develop heart disease. Uh, there's an increased risk of high blood pressure, colon cancer risk is higher uh, by 36%. And there's nearly a three times risk of diabetes, which is a very big deal. Sleep and diabetes are closely linked. So um, note that there are lots of things on this infographic, but those are just some highlights to show you that there are some long-term consequences of sleep deprivation. Uh, here's a famous driving simulator experiment in which um, uh, driving performance was compared in sleep deprivation versus alcohol. So I'm gonna ask you a quiz. What do you think the blood alcohol concentration equivalent is? And remember that 0 0.8 is drunk driving in most states. So what's the blood alcohol concentration equivalent of driving performance after being awake for 24 hours? Any guesses? You can just unmute. It's gotta be at, at least, uh, it's gotta be higher than the 0 0.8. I don't know how it much is. It, it's yeah. 0.1, Jeff, as a matter of fact. So we're, if we're awake for 24 hours, it's the equivalent of being drunk. Um, so there's the sleepy guy or the guy slugging some whiskey. It's kind of the same deal. So <laughs> beware that, and there are things that can help mitigate that sleepiness. And most of us who've driven sleepy after 24 hours of being awake haven't crashed, but just know that a lot of people who are drunk haven't crashed either the odds are not necessarily high that you're gonna crash, but the consequences are so great, right? So either getting injured or hurting somebody else or just getting caught. So know that drunk driving is, our uh, sleep deprivation is similar to drunk driving in terms of our performance equivalent. And think you guys use your brains for a living like I do. 
your brain does not work as well if you're sleep deprived. So your decision-making capacity and reaction time and, and perception of other people's emotions, which is very much what you guys need to do as mediators, read other people, right? You're not as good at that if you're in the uh, sleep deprivation zone. This is just a little map of how much we need to sleep. So newborns sleep like house cats, 14 to 17 hours. Toddlers, 11 to 14 hours. School-age kids, 11 to 12. 10-year-olds, so I went backwards here. 10-year-olds need 10 hours. So that's kind of a nice roadmap if anyone cares how much kids sleep need to sleep. And then teenagers need uh, eight to 10 hours still. Adults, uh, kind of through the middle ages of adults need seven to nine, but elderly people still need seven to eight hours. So the sleep need does not diminish as we get older. We need sleep. Sometimes it spreads out like other things as we get older, but it doesn't necessarily um, diminish in total quantity. So know that we still need seven to eight hours as we age. The brain has two control systems I alluded to earlier. We are meant to sleep seven to nine hours a night, same time each night without daytime sleepiness. And that is controlled by the fuel tank, which is your, we call it the homeostatic sleep um, mechanism that when we sleep at night, we tank up and fill up our fuel tank or half tank up and kind of half fill the tank, but the car still runs on half a tank, right? So you can fuel the tank. And then when you wake up, the tank starts to diminish. And so the fuel tank, as you're awake for hours, starts to go down. So that's your, your fuel tank. And then the clock, your circadian rhythm says, go to bed at the same time each night and get up at the same time each day. It's a fairly strong mechanism for most people to sleep at night and be awake in the daytime. And when you need to stay up at night because you're doing a case or you're going long into the evening um, in, uh, with the need for work or personal reasons, then you are pushing through your circadian time to sleep and you might be far away from where your, your fuel tank was filled and be very sleepy because of both of those reasons. Sometimes they misalign and your fuel tank might be empty. You've stayed up all night or most of the night, but your clock says, be awake at seven o'clock in the morning. And you might've had that feeling where you've had an all-nighter or nearly an all-nighter and at seven or eight in the morning, you think I'm up, I'm good feeling all right, must not be sleep deprived now. That's because your circadian rhythm is covering for its friend, the homeostatic fuel tank. So there are sometimes misalignments are, that are to your advantage, which is why doctors can drive home after being on call, um, sometimes without crashing, not always, but sometimes they're, um, they're misaligned to your disadvantage. So it's nighttime, you uh, are, uh, sleep deprived, uh, or maybe you've even tanked up on, on, on sleep, but it's nighttime and your circadian rhythm is expecting you to be asleep. Even if you've had a good night's sleep the night before and had a nap, you might still feel very sleepy because your circadian rhythm says it's two o'clock in the morning. What are you doing up? So know that these are two mechanisms. So it's not all about how much you've slept or when you've slept. It's both. Sleep has impact on all these different arenas of our well-being, cognitive, emotional, health and safety, and physical. I'll give you some of the data that, that show you that. Um, here's our friend, the sleep hypnogram. This is REM sleep. Cognitive sleep, or our cognitive function depends on rapid eye movement sleep. I call REM sleep smart sleep because it allows us to think and learn and remember. So when we have uh, a big learning experience. Let's say you've learned a, a whole new topic and done a lot of reading one day, or you were studying for an exam when, back when you were in school, you filled your brain with more information. You're going to literally have more REM sleep that night because it's laying down more memory. REM sleep is also important for learning and memory the next day. So little babies um, have about half the night in REM sleep because they're building so much neural connection and learning so much. So just know that sleep is critically important for cognition, REM sleep particularly. Sleep facilitates learning. Here's, an, here's a, a study in which right-handed subjects learned a number sequence on a keyboard with their left hand, which so it's a hard task to do. And half of them learning it, learned it in the morning and their skills improved as they learned it. The other half learned it at night and their skills also improved as they learned it. And then um, the morning people had 12 hours of daytime to pass, the night people had 12 hours of nighttime, including eight hours of sleep. Testing them the next day, the day, the people who learned it in the morning and then spent the day um, had no change, not, not the next day, excuse me, testing 12 hours later, 
after learning something in the morning, those people had no change in their skill. Oh yes, with sleep, excuse me. So the next day, sleeping didn't add anything for the next morning. However, if they learned something in the evening and then slept soon after, they had a 20% improvement in their skill after sleeping. So sleeping actually helps form memory. Something happens during sleep that we jokingly washing now, there's a rinse cycle, sort of like your laundry has to rinse out the dirty water. There's a rinse cycle during sleep that actually washes out toxins from the cerebrospinal fluid. And sleep is required for this to happen. And it might rinse out, we think, the toxins that build the bad stuff that contributes to Alzheimer's disease, for example, or other conditions. So it's important to flush that stuff out and it only happens during sleep. And so if you think of the lather, rinse, repeat cycle of sleep and wake, it's very important to get sleep on a regular basis and enough of it for your long-term brain health. Creativity is sparked by sleeping. So Keith Richards famously made the, um, the, uh, the, came up with the lick to satisfaction while he was sleeping. And Paul McCartney apparently came up with the, um, the tune to yesterday when he was sleeping. So there are many other examples of people who creatively solved problems or came up with new material while sleeping. Sports performance improves with sleep. This is Sarah Hughes who won the gold medal in uh, ice skating in the Olympics sometime in the 90s. I can't remember what year it was. And she was friends with a guy who we named James Moss who was a sleep specialist. And he was having dinner with their family and she was training for the Olympics and she couldn't get over the hump of doing one particular move, the triple axel or something. She couldn't stick the landing. And she, he said, how are you sleeping and training? And she was getting up doing two a days like all good ice skaters. She was skating at five in the morning and then again in the afternoon, she's still in high school. And he said, I'll challenge you to sleep in the morning an extra hour or two, skip your morning practice and just do the evening practice and see what happens. She said, I can't do that, I'm a skater. We do two a days. And he said, give me a month, just try it. And she stuck the landing after a month of skipping her morning practice because she was sleeping longer. Michael Phelps famously slept around 12 hours a night, I think, when he was in his uh, training mode. So uh, many other examples of, of high performance athletes demonstrate that they often sleep more than others and adequate sleep can improve their performance. Um, several studies, I'll just show you some brief, brief examples. Increase in nightly sleep among tennis players, increase their serving accuracy by 6%. Um, among some uh, baseball players, nightly sleep increased just a little bit from 6.3 to 6.9 hours, only for five nights, improved their visual spatial search response times. Basketball players, WNBA had a baseline sleep of 7.8 hours. So they add, that's a lot, right? That's a good amount of sleep, but they added almost two hours for six weeks and they had an increase in their free throw rate by three and three point shots by 9%, a huge jump. 4% better sprint times and better mood. Lots of impressive um, results from adding sleep for, for sleep and uh, decreased sleepiness um, for these athletes. And in rugby players, 6% increase in sleep for three weeks, not much, right? Gave them 4% faster reaction times and 19% reduction in cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone you probably are familiar with and uh, does a lot of things to the body that are, that are negative. Cortisol is important if you're running away from a tiger, but you don't want cortisol circulating when you don't need it. And so if you've got a lot of cortisol circulating, which goes up when you have sleep deprivation, it's unhealthy for your body. And reducing cortisol by sleeping a little longer is a good long-term health measure. Emotional health, <laughs> these people are all sleep deprived, but one of them looks angry, another one looks angry, this guy looks frustrated, this person is depressed, this one is just indignant. Um, and so sleep actually can help mitigate these emotional states and produce happier, uh, better engaged emotional states. So if you're thinking of yourself, that might be a good thing. If you're thinking of wearing down somebody to make a decision, might work to your advantage unless you make them like this guy. <laughs> so you don't want to make your, your uh, um, uh, people angry necessarily. Uh, so weight management is highly influenced by healthy sleep. Hunger and fullness are balanced by a variety of, of hormones, but I'm going to give you an example of a couple of them. Hunger is stimulated or, or signaled by a, a hormone called ghrelin. I always think of it because your stomach goes grr, ghrelin. And fullness 
is signaled by a hormone called leptin. If you're sleep deprived, or you have either an insufficient quantity or quality of sleep from sleep apnea, for example, then the hunger hormone doesn't work as well and the fullness hormone goes up. And so you're also more likely to eat junk food. So when I was on call, for example, as a doctor, I'd have a long night and the next day, instead of getting my usual spinach salad and garbanzo beans in the, in the cafeteria, I would go straight for the burgers or pizza. It was a very biological craving for junk food for you know, fat, salt, um, and uh, carbs because I was sleep deprived. And so our hunger goes up and our fullness goes down, but we also crave things that are less well-balanced for our bodies. If you have good sleep quality and quantity, then you're much more likely to have a balance in hunger and fullness and shop in the produce aisle instead of the cheeseburger aisle. So what happens if we don't get enough sleep or good enough sleep? Well, a whole bunch of consequences, including the things that I've already talked about. Sleepiness and fatigue, obviously. Accidents. This is a guy, a 21-year-old college student who was going from Wyoming to the East Coast, uh, packing the night before, stayed up late, got four hours of sleep, drove across country to get to college, and fell asleep at the wheel and impaled his SUV on 120 um, feet of guardrail. Luckily, you'll notice that it's on the passenger side. There was no passenger because he was going to college and he was unscathed, but a very, very dangerous accident from sleep deprivation. When we have a fall asleep at the wheel accident, you probably know this, uh, you don't step on the brake. And so they're very um, high injury prone or uh, fatal, uh, high fatality accidents when it falls asleep at the wheel accidents. Medical errors, among many other errors, errors in your work, cognitive errors can happen, sleep deprivation, mood disturbance, as I had mentioned, medical consequences that I mentioned in the, in the infographic. So lots of things can come from not getting good enough sleep quality or quantity. Well, how do you not get good sleep quality or quantity? What can go wrong with sleep? I think of it as three buckets of, of problems. Either you're too sleepy, um, do funny things in your sleep, or have trouble sleeping. And uh, we'll walk through these a little bit. I'm going to spend more time on trouble sleeping because I want to give you some strategies if you have trouble sleeping that you can apply to yourselves. We won't talk much about doing funny things in your sleep, which are things like sleepwalking, acting out dreams, um, and sleep talking and some things. The acting out dreams can actually cause injury. This is a comedian named Mike Birbiglia. Some of you might be familiar with. He's very funny, but he also has REM sleep behavior disorder and managed to um, uh, climb out of the window at the La Quinta Inn one night and break through the glass and in a dream and uh, in his underwear. And so he had found himself on the ground covered in blood and glass in his underpants, had to run to the front desk and say, could you please let me back in my room? <laughs> so um, it's he's a, he's a very funny comedian if you wanna listen to him. And it's an interesting um, uh, explanation of REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, the too sleepy part, this person on the left, sleepiness comes from four different buckets of causes, either quantity, just not getting enough sleep, which probably happens to you guys sometimes, quality of sleep. The most common reason that we see in a sleep center is sleep apnea, stopping breathing in sleep causes poor sleep quantity and can cause sleepiness. Um, poor timing of sleep, if you're timing, if you're a circadian rhythm, if your clock isn't aligned with your life, then it could be a circadian rhythm problem where you could have a circadian rhythm disorder that shifts your sleep time propensity out of the place where it needs to be. And then the fourth bucket is uh, the total sleep need. So if you have a high sleep need because you have narcolepsy or another sleep disorder like that, or because you're on medicine or have a medical condition that causes a high sleep need, that falls in the, that fourth bucket. So just know that there are a lot of reasons to be sleepy that are more than just sleep deprivation and sleep apnea. And as a sleep specialist, I walk through people's whole stories to understand what the sleepiness is. Often it's more than one thing. And so they're entirely treatable almost always, which is the, the uh, rewarding part of, one of the many rewarding parts of my job. Let's talk about insomnia, which is difficulty initiating sleep or maintaining sleep or early morning waking. And insomnia isn't just a diagnosis. It's really a condition, it's a symptom. We'll, we'll give you an analogy in a moment. Uh, orthosomnia is what people sometimes perceive as insomnia, but it's really the obsession of perfect sleep. So since I'm wearing a Fitbit watch right now, which I thought I was going to wear for a week when I needed the technology, and I've changed my life by wearing this technology every day because it's so much fun. My nice watch sits in my jewelry box. But because we have 
devices, many of us wear devices all the time. I don't remind to sleep, but a lot of people do. Lots of people have lots of data about their sleep. So somebody might feel really good, but their watch says they're not sleeping well. And they'll come in and they'll say, I need to fix my sleep. And I'll say, what's wrong? And they'll say, my Apple watch says that I'm not sleeping well. And I'll say, well, how much are you sleeping? Eight hours. How do you feel? Fantastic. And we go through the story. And it's really that the watch perceives a problem that isn't necessarily there. So there are some people who get so fixated on perfect sleep, sometimes prompted by technology, that uh, it can get in the way of perceiving healthy sleep. Um, more commonly, there are other forms of insomnia um, and, and sleep problems. Here's here kind of the, the ways to know that you have a problem. If you, if you don't know if you have a sleep problem, then your symptoms might tell you, you might start paying attention to your symptoms, sleepiness or being awake when you mean to be asleep, or uh, you might um, have a disruptive sleep environment. It looks like she's covering her ear because her partner is snoring, so her problem is him. On the other hand, the observation of others, maybe this person is talking to her partner about his snoring, so he might be the problem for himself. And then wearables, as I said, might actually detect for, for good reason sleep problems, not just give you orthosomnia. So what can you do about it? Well, here's one option, stick your head in the sand. I don't recommend that, it's not very effective. Here are some big chunks of sleep problems. So excessive sleepiness, all these things that might go along with excessive sleepiness um, should be addressed. I would suggest starting with a two week trial of seven or eight hours of sleep per night and good sleep hygiene, good sleep habits. I'll give you some of those in a little bit. Review your medications. So if you're feeling sleepy and you've got medication that might be contributing to that, give that a thought. And if you're still sleepy after those do it yourself plans, then go see a doctor. If you have trouble sleeping for any reason in any form, start with a two week trial of good sleep habits. And then if it doesn't work, go see a doctor. And if you do funny things in your sleep, see a doctor. That's something that knows, is not a do it yourselfer. So let's talk about insomnia. When sleep eludes you, this woman is lying in her bed with big pink neon sign. This is fairly timely now that Barbie's so popular with the pink, but. Um, she's just looking at this big neon sign of sleep, kind of wondering when her turn is going to come. And a lot of people who can't sleep feel like they're lying awake just thinking about sleep. And as I said, it's trouble getting to sleep, staying asleep, or early morning waking. And it comes for a variety of reasons. These this is just a little interlude to show you the elephant seals on the middle California coast are expert sleepers and they do not have insomnia. They sleep through anything and they crawl right over their sleeping friends to get to the ocean, even though they could scoot around this way in the nice open gap, they climb right over each other <laughs> to get to the ocean because it's shorter. It's very funny to see, but they're, they spend the majority of the day sleeping and sunning themselves. And humans are not such expert sleepers. And many of us have trouble getting to sleep or staying asleep. So a very common reason for that is our sleep habits or inadequate sleep hygiene, which is an insulting term, but it's the actual uh, official term for trouble sleeping or for sleep habits that get in the way. Think of coffee or caffeine, alcohol, uh, curtailing sleep with, with other activities like late night gaming or working in bed. Maybe this person isn't just entertaining herself. Maybe she's staying up late working, um, drinking too much fluid, uh, surfing the net in bed, or just lying awake and being unable to um, sleep and then watching the clock. So there are lots of ways that we can um, have trouble sleeping because of our own behavior. Here's one that I love. He, uh, she says, I have to get up early, so I'm going to go to bed now and lay, uh, and lay there wide awake until I would normally go to bed. So going to bed much earlier than your brain is ready to go to sleep is not a good strategy because your circadian rhythm isn't ready to tuck you in yet. And so just going to bed extra early isn't good sleep hygiene. And some people develop insomnia because they end up spending 12 hours in bed when it just makes Swiss cheese out of their sleep and consolidating it into the time when they're more likely to sleep is better sleep hygiene. We'll take a little brief diversion to caffeine, which is the most widely consumed psychoactive substance on earth, one cup per human per day on average around the world. And the red is tea, but if you look at the coffee, the brown is coffee and um, there are 75 to 100% of people in the, in the dark brown regions consume coffee on a regular basis. So not, certainly not 100%, but a large number of people consume caffeine throughout the world. 
And the, how it works, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the science of caffeine. And I'm gonna guess many of you use caffeine. Most of us do. It blocks uh, a, a, a hormone called adenosine or a transmitter called adenosine. During wakefulness, adenosine builds up and signals sleepiness. So as you've been, as your fuel tank is emptying, your adenosine is building up and plugging into receptors to indicate sleepiness, which is why partway through the day, you start to feel sleepy if you haven't had quite enough sleep. Caffeine, so here's the adenosine receptor and adenosine is supposed to be hitting these and making you start feeling sleepy. Caffeine blocks those receptors. It's like a little parking, a little car parking in the spot so that this guy can't come in here. So it blocks the sleepiness indicator of adenosine. It also promotes adrenaline. So that's the fight or flight hormone. So you feel energetic from caffeine and it increases dopamine, which is the pleasure and reward center or um, hormone. And this is variable within different people. There's a lot of physiological variability, but um, beware that it has several different mechanisms, but blocking adenosine is the one that keeps us awake. The peak concentration happens in about 30 minutes. And one of the things when I teach residents in our health center, in our, in our um, health system about healthy sleep uh, and sleep safety on their naturally sleep deprived jobs, I, I tell them that um, if they use caffeine, one of the strategies if they're taking a nap is because the peak concentration isn't for 30 minutes, they can have a cup of coffee when they're on call, take a nap immediately, and when they wake up, the caffeine will have benefit, but it doesn't keep them from taking a nap immediately. We call that a nappuccino. Um, and the half-life of caffeine is six hours. And if you understand how half-life works, it means that, or even if you don't, I'll tell you, uh, that it takes about six hours to get rid of half the caffeine. So here's some math for you. If you have this cup of coffee, 150 milligram cup of coffee at 6 a.m., you think, oh, I'm just having one cup of coffee in the morning. But by 9 p.m., you still have 28 milligrams of that cup of coffee on caffeine on board. That's about the same as a Coke, which is 34 milligrams. So it's like drinking a Coke at 9 p.m. if you've had a cup of coffee at um, 6 a.m. Let's talk about Starbucks, just as an example. The Venti, which is 20 um, ounces, has 400 milligrams of caffeine. And the Trenta, presumably 30 ounces, has 600 milligrams of caffeine. It's an enormous caffeine load. If you have a Trenta at six o'clock in the morning, you drive through the drive-through, you're going to your office and you think, I'm just gonna get me a big bucket of Starbucks. You have the Trenta at 6 a.m. At 9 p.m., you still have 112 milligrams of caffeine on board. So almost like having a cup of joe right before bed. So just know that it hangs around for longer. And for some of us, and I'm pretty sure I'm one of these people, some of us are slow metabolizers of caffeine. We have a variant of the CYP um, uh, 1A2 gene, I think, that um, is the asterisk 1F variety that makes us metabolize caffeine very slowly. It's a small percentage of people, but it means that there's much more caffeine on board at bedtime. So if I have a cup of coffee in the morning, I am feeling it in my sleep. I still cheat and have a cup of coffee now and then, but I've really gone to mostly decaf. And the, the residual caffeine in decaf, which is between three and 30%, is sufficient for me because I'm such a cheap date for, ca for caffeine. So if you're more susceptible um, to caffeine, it might keep you more awake than, than others. Um, okay, conditioned or habitual insomnia is a very common problem um, in which people are conditioned or habituated not to be uh, able to sleep in their own bed. I'll explain that in a minute. The um, cartoon that goes along with this is the, she says, don't start thinking any big thoughts now, dear, you've got to get up early. So lying awake in bed, kind of thinking and processing is typical with people who have conditioned insomnia. And um, let me explain a little bit further. It's the habituation, even if you're sleepy, you've got a high sleep drive, let's say your circadian rhythm and your homeostatic fuel tank say it's time to go to bed, you might even be falling asleep watching Jimmy Kimmel on TV, get up and go to bed, and then you're wide awake because your body has been conditioned to be awake in bed. And then sometimes people feel anxious about sleep. The harder they try to sleep, the harder it is to sleep. It's a real problem. And it looks like something that could be fixed with medicine. So lots of doctors prescribe medicine. It's not, it requires behavioral therapy. So um, it's very, very treatable, but we need to recondition someone to fall asleep in bed. Another form of insomnia is environmental. If you live near the airport or traffic um, or a snoring person or very, very loud critter like this, um, these are very disruptive. 
susceptibly acute, but very disruptive. Lots of people sleep with their pets. And so if you create environmental um, insomnia by having um, a baby or a dog um, or a, a noisy bed partner, then consider your, just take your lumps if it's a baby, but maybe have the dog sleep somewhere else. The baby will eventually grow up to be this. Well, this kid is now 20. This is my daughter. She has a splinter in her thumb. And I use this as an analogy to tell you that insomnia, as I mentioned before, is a symptom, not a diagnosis, just like pain is a symptom. So she was doing something and she got a splinter in her finger and her thumb and it hurt. And she came to me and didn't ask me for morphine or Tylenol. She said, where are the tweezers? And then she pulled it out and solved the problem. So the pain was caused by the splinter and the pain was resolved by pulling out the splinters. And so I find people splinters of insomnia and get them out. And occasionally somebody needs to take medicine to feel better, but usually not. So most insomnia can be treated without all of these things. They have their place and there are a whole bunch more. Um, they have their place, but I very rarely prescribe medication and I've been practicing for 25 years. So, and I see a lot of sleep patients because most of the time we can manage it with behavior. So I'm gonna give you a recipe for healthy sleep hygiene and know that it's a recipe, not a smorgasbord. And so the recipe is all the ingredients that go into good sleep hygiene. Now I made this loaf of sourdough and I might've made it without salt if I chose not to use the full recipe. And if I tasted it and it didn't taste good, I would go back and add salt to my next batch, right? But I can't take something out of the recipe once I've started to make the dough it's all in there and then you add things to make it better. So of the sleep behaviors, think of them as ingredients in a recipe, not a smorgasbord where, well, I'll leave the flour out and put in the salt this time. No, nope, you've got to add all of the things on the recipe, even if it's one at a time. So here's your recipe. Bedtime when you're sleepy, not more than eight hours in bed. Keep a regular wake time, set your alarm, don't check the clock. Don't check the clock. Don't check the clock. Don't look at the clock in the middle of the night if you can't sleep. And if you wake up and think, I'm just gonna look for a sec, it's not the light exposure, it's the knowledge. So just don't look. <laughs> when you know what time it is, it can be very stimulating and think, oh my gosh, I've only got three more hours to sleep. And then you might be awake. Um, limit caffeine and alcohol, avoid naps. Alcohol, by the way, is wonderful if you choose to use it recreationally in moderation, but it does disturb the second half of the night of sleep. So even if you use it to feel sleepy in the beginning of the night, bad idea, it's a terrible sleep drug, but many people do. Um, then if you feel unrefreshed in the morning, even if you weren't consciously awake, it might've been that the alcohol was disturbing the quality of the second half of the night of sleep. So beware of alcohol, use wisely, don't drive. Um, avoid naps, limit fluids before bed, sleep only in bed and not elsewhere. Use your bed only for sleep and sex. We'll talk about that again in a minute. And if you can't sleep for 15 or 20 minutes, get up to read before you get back to bed. Don't lie awake in bed for a long period of time. If you use your bed only for sleeping and intimacy, that includes not lying awake thinking. So you're gonna get out of bed, read or do something quiet somewhere else and then come back to bed. And avoiding naps is if you have trouble sleeping and if you don't need a safety nap or a strategy nap, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So if you get up to read, by the way, I like this um, Rembrandt picture because he's reading at a table in an uncomfortable upright chair. So if you get up to read, don't go to your Berka lounger and lie down and think, I'm just gonna read this book and fall asleep in your, in your lounge chair. You wanna sleep only in bed and be awake to read someplace else. And then when you feel like the chair's too uncomfortable or you're not paying attention to what you're reading, go back to bed. This is a toilet. The toilet is used for two things. And we know how to use the toilet because we've been trained as little kids. And we're so conditioned to use the toilet that, for example, when I go around my office, if I'm seeing patients and doing things and go into the bathroom to wash my hands, I very often see the toilet and I'm like, oh, now I have to go to the bathroom. We are very conditioned to go to the bathroom at the toilet, even if we didn't feel that strongly in need of going to the bathroom when we go. Or if we want to go, let's say you bought a a ticket to uh, Oppenheimer and Barbie and you're gonna see a double feature and you don't wanna have to get up and go to the bathroom. You run to the bathroom before you go and your body knows, okay, toilet, go in it. We're very conditioned to do a physiological thing, pee, in the toilet when we're at the toilet, very well conditioned. On the other hand, 
this is a bed and it's a very complicated space for some people so that a lot of things happen there. Not much else happens on the toilet, maybe occasional crossword puzzle, but uh, <laughs> in bed, a lot of people end up doing things in bed, reading, watching TV, online, knitting, doing whatever it is that's not sleep or intimacy. And it can develop all sorts of things for your brain to associate with bed, which aren't all bad, but what it does is weaken the association of your bed and sleep. So you wanna tightly associate bed and sleep in a nice little package that says when you're in bed, just like when you're in the bathroom, you think, oh, now I have to go to the bathroom. When you're in bed, you want your brain to think, oh, now I'm gonna to go to sleep. So it, it pairs that very nicely if you only use your bed for sleeping and intimacy. So I tell my patients, if you're not sleeping or getting lucky, get out of bed. Sleep restriction is a way to handle insomnia for some people who can't sleep, particularly conditioned insomnia. But if you're also spending a long time in bed, restricting sleep to the amount of time that you're actually sleeping is the trick. So your baseline is you're in bed for eight for, for X hours. So let's say you can't sleep and you're spending 10 hours a night trying to sleep for heaven's sakes, but you're only sleeping six hours a night. So then your sleep restriction strategy would be to choose six hours to be in bed the same time each night. So let's say you go to bed at eight and get up at six and you're just not sleeping very well, but you sleep the best kind of in the middle of the night. Maybe you can change your schedule to 10 to four, get good at that six hours and then expand closer to eight gradually, not 10. Okay, so that's sleep restriction. It's a very um, effective tool for fixing insomnia for, for some people. So when you're sleeping well, through the night, if you're still sleepy in the daytime, not getting enough sleep, increase by 30 minutes each week until you're at eight hours or well rested. Meditation or focused attention is another strategy. Some of you must have done some meditation exercises at some point, and I don't recommend meditation for everyone, but this is a very nice strategy. If you're in the habit, this isn't a meditation class. We can do further work together if you wanna contact me, but meditation or focused attention is a very nice approach as long as it's not the same meditation you do when you're somewhere else. So doing a meditation in bed is different than meditation sitting in your meditation on your meditation cushion or wherever you choose to do it. So make sure that you've got one that is sleep specific because you want to habituate to that. Uh, you could have attention to breath. You could use uh, just a focus on your breath, thinking of breathing in every breathing in and out every breath, just focusing on your breath which allows you attention to that rather than attention to all the other things that are running around in your brain. You can count your breaths. You could use four, seven, eight breathing. So breathing in four counts, hold seven, breathe out eight. That's a, that's a, a, a technique that's used at the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Health and in, at University of Arizona. And it's been shown to help anxiety. It could also potentially be a technique for sleep. Or what I like to do is four, four, pause breathing, which is breathe in for four, breathe out for four, and then pause, and then start breathing in again. So that pause actually allows you to kind of reset each time. It's actually a very comfortable feeling. So that's a breathing exercise, or several breathing approaches to fixing insomnia. You could do a body scan head to toe of taking awareness to each part of your body, or you can do a body scan muscle tension so you can tense muscles in series and relax them head to toe. You could do a gratitude and well-being meditation. This is a specific kind of meditation, but you could choose a gratitude or choose, uh, I like to choose, um, it doesn't have to be the same person all the time, but choose a, a series of people or a list of people, starting with the most important ones who just come to mind who are important to you, and you say to yourself why you're, or you can speak to them if you want, why you're grateful for them, and then what you wish for them. So a well-being, a well-being wish for I wish for you to be healthy and at peace and whatever. So pick your own meditation, but gratitude and well-being is a very nice thing that doesn't have you focus on one thing that can can allow distraction to be more common, but gives you kind of a, a list of tasks to do, and it has some. Uh, some good chemistry associated with it. Here's my favorite one. This is mine. This is, I call this the parking lot. So your brain is a parking lot and in your brain, brain parking lot are a million parking spaces where the cars all park that are ideas or thoughts or memories. It does not work like that, but you get the idea. 
So in the parking lot, there's one VIP parking space. That's the top of mind. That's me touching my forehead with my finger right now. Whatever is at top of mind. And you can only have one thought in any given moment. It might seem like a lot, but it's just a drive-through if there are lots of thoughts flipping their attention or flipping their, their positioning in your VIP parking spot. You own the company. So you get to park whatever thought you want in your VIP spot. So what I recommend is choosing a thought that's a very specific memory or experience that makes you feel wonderful mind and body. Once you get to that thought, I want you to put it at top of mind and genuinely focus on that and feel the feeling that you get of remembering that very moment in time. It's gonna drift and other cars are gonna park in there because they're greedy and they're gonna want your attention. You're gonna recognize there are other ideas just like any meditation. Just replace your, your favorite memory that you're savoring, keep replacing it, and eventually you'll fall asleep with that thought in mind and your body will condition to being, when you're in that thought, to being sleepy and more likely to fall asleep. It's a little bit of an association like a teddy bear or a blanket for a kid, but you get to choose the thought. It gives you a little bit of happy emotion and some good chemistry. It's a little bit of a placeholder or distractor from other thoughts. And um, you get to relive that, that nice little experience. So that's the parking lot. Um, here are some options for your parking lot that, you know, this kid, this guy's dancing with his kids or uh, the best massage you ever got, but one very specific part of it, you know, think a very specific, a very specific thing that gives you joy, the best drive you ever made on the golf course or a hike that you did that gave you joy. So find your spot. If you have a, a, a thought or a memory, it doesn't have to change the world. It just needs to give you joy. That's the parking lot. Uh, healthy sleep promotes alertness. We're going to talk, oh, a little bit of caffeine science again. Napping actually, uh, this is napping science, not caffeine science. And there was a study that showed that napping was actually better than caffeine at improving cognitive or uh, motor performance. So know that napping, strategic napping has value. Um, napping can improve your behavior, your mood, and your uh, interactions. It can help cognition. So cognitive performance degrades with sleep deprivation and improves with a 30 minute nap. I'm gonna give you some strategies for napping now. The timing of napping should respect your circadian rhythm if you can. So if possible, take advantage of the windows of opportunity when you're sleepiest, two to 5 a.m. middle of the night or two to 5 p.m. at that kind of siesta time. If not, and if you need a nap because you've been sleep deprived and you need a safety nap, then take it whenever you can. You can tank up if you know you're going to have an extended long night of work. You can take a tank up nap even if you had a, a good sleep the night before. If you're permitted to sleep on the job um, and put your head down, it's uh, certainly effective to do that if it doesn't get you fired. Um, short naps are five to 30 minutes and they're best to avoid that sleep inertia that's hard to wake up from. Longer naps, if you're truly sleep deprived, can get through the cycles of deeper sleep and make you feel refreshed. But just know that when you wake up, if you wake up in a deep sleep, you might need to, or just feel unrefreshed after a nap. Remember, some sleep is better than no sleep. You have to allow time for your hard drive to kind of wake up. So give yourself a few minutes to let your hard drive start up. Don't think that sleep was a bad idea. Just remember your brain might need a few minutes to wake up. Some people up to 30 minutes. Anne Lamott, the writer, said almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. I think of napping, um, the analogy that I like for napping is that an apple, if you ate an apple every day, you'd get a little nutrition. It wouldn't disrupt what you were doing in terms of your normal dietary intake. So if you ate a, an apple at 10 o'clock every morning, it would probably not disrupt anything and, and wouldn't make you get a new pair of pants because it wouldn't make you gain weight for the 50 to 80 calories in the apple. On the other hand, if you had a big bag of Doritos every day at 10 o'clock, you probably need new pants because it's gonna add calories that are sort of empty calories and take away from nutritional balance that would otherwise be there. So an apple nap is a short nap uh, that is sort of like a power nap that doesn't disrupt sleep. Uh, a Doritos nap is a like regularly having a long nap that takes away from nighttime sleep. So don't replace nighttime sleep, the nutrition of sleep with a long nap. You wanna focus your net, your sleep into one big package and avoid a big Doritos nap 
If you need a nap, aim for the apple nap. Sleeping um, helps memory consolidation and emotional processing and prepares us for real life stressors, particularly REM sleep. That last dream cycle of the night might be the most therapeutic, by the way. So there have been studies that show that skipping this last REM period um, keeps you from healing emotionally when you're working through things. So you need the full night of sleep, including that last REM cycle to get the most out of it. Jet lag is very common. Um, I'm gonna move a little swiftly now but jet lag happens when we shift time zones, of course. You can prepare for travel by gradually adjusting your sleep at home to your destination time. Um, assume the local time as quickly as possible. Consider melatonin, that's a caveat. It's not FDA controlled. There's a lot of variability in the, in the, in the, um, in the products. So be very careful with melatonin. And if you do choose one, get the UP, I always forget the acronym, it's UP something, it's the United Pharmaceutical Association, I think, label that assures the content of it. Um, and here's the last slide. So here are your strategies to make sleep your superpower. Seven to nine hours of sleep per night, regular sleep schedule, prepare for travel by adjusting in advance if you can, limit your naps unless you're sleep deprived. If so, use strategic napping principles, limit your caffeine and alcohol, um, use your bed for sleep, sleep in bed. If you're not sleeping or getting lucky, get out. And then avoid checking the clock, set an alarm. Even if you don't need the alarm, it's gonna keep you from looking at the clock so you know when you're allowed to look at the clock. And uh, finish the night of sleep. Um, use the parking lot or other meditative strategies if you can't sleep and see a doctor for symptoms that don't resolve. So this is a little gift to you that you can take home and apply. And then I'm just gonna give you um, my last analogy, which is this is the sardine tank at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And see how they're all swimming right, except for this one little sardine is swimming left. And I, I don't know what's motivating her to go to the left, but she's doing something differently. And I think of her as the one who's practicing the best sleep hygiene. So she got the memo and she's practicing good sleep hygiene. All the rest of these guys are staying up too late and drinking too much. <clears throat> so if you're smart, You'll practice like the one, the left swimming sardine, and eventually the people in your life who learn from you will all start swimming in the same direction for their healthy sleep. So I'll leave the strategies up and offer a moment for a brief discussion. I'm sorry, we only have a few minutes left. Sarah, that's, that's great. So much helpful information. Thank you. Comment just for a minute, please, about the situation I mentioned early in the talk. When we're dealing with other people in mediations, and we want to keep them together to keep the momentum going. How do we know when we're actually behaving unethically or abusing them by keeping them there beyond the point where they can think straight? It's a good question. And it's so, so let me understand your work. You, you're in a mediation situation and you've got your, you don't have a client, you're a mediator, right? And we're, so you want to solve the problem. We want to right. help them help people solve problems for themselves. Right. So they're doing this and you want to get them to do this. Right. And um, so I would say uh, I can't tell you where the where the where the ethics line is, but know that uh, that if they it's probably a stressful situation when they're in mediation. Right. So they might come to you sleep deprived and a little bit fragile. So know that and know that they're maybe emotionally and cognitively not at their best. And you know, wearing them down and getting them to an agreement is one thing, but if you can read the signs, if you see that somebody is becoming more emotionally uh, fragile or more hostile or more disagreeable, if you go back to the slides of the, the you know, doctor yelling into the stethoscope of her colleague, if, if that behavior is coming up, you might blame sleep deprivation and recognize that you might be at the point where you need to stop and, and refresh the next day. So uh, sleep deprivation is a common form of torture. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, and uh, and if you've got people who are looking more stressed or more fragile or more irrational or less cognitively capable, just know that sleep deprivation, um, particularly over several nights, and it doesn't take that long. I showed you some situations where several nights of better sleep improve, uh, improve uh, sports performance. Remember, the opposite is true, that several nights of half a night of sleep create terrible cognitive performance. And so uh, be sensitive to to your your clients. Do you call them clients? Yeah. Okay. Who are um, 
who are maybe breaking down if it if it feels like it's falling apart and and the hours are long you can be the judge to decide whether um whether it might be better to reboot with a night of sleep and can it be cured effectively by giving somebody a 20 ounce cup of coffee or something with sugar or salt or I would say I would say no because um that sleep drive it can be masked just like drunkenness you know you, everybody knows that you can be drunk and if you have a cup of coffee you're no safer to drive home you just feel more alert um if you're sleep deprived it can mask the the uh sleepiness part but the sleepiness is only one aspect there's cognitive failure there's emotional failure and so I don't believe that a cup of coffee, and I can't tell you this, that there, and maybe this is a study that's been done or should be done. I can't tell you that people recover emotionally and cognitively from the caffeine. I can tell you that they might feel more alert temporarily, but I don't think that it makes their judgment better or their emotions better. They might in fact be, be now jacked up on coffee and cranky. <laughs> so I, I would say if it's just sleepiness, sure, block those adenosine receptors with caffeine and keep them awake. But remember, there is a lot more to sleep deprivation than sleepiness. So beware. Read the room. Thank you. And this has been a fantastic insight into the science of sleep, how we can take better care of ourselves and make sure that those we love are taking better care of themselves as well. Thank Dr. Sarah Zalek, thank you so much. I hope that people are motivated to contribute to Peoria Grown in your honor. That's www.peoriagrown.com, www.peoriagrown.com. Once again, thank you for an outstanding presentation, Dr. Sarah Zalek. And with that, we are complete. Thank you. I will leave my email up here for anyone who wants to contact me. I'll just put it on the screen at sarahzalek at gmail.com. So I thank you so much for inviting me to speak at your group. You're welcome.